Well, good morning, everyone. Trust you're enjoying a nice long weekend. You can turn in uh, in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians 11. That's where we're going to be this morning. How many of you are old enough to remember when computers showed up on the scene? You're old like me. Uh, And and it was amazing to me how quickly uh, when computers show up and and you had Microsoft DOS and the Microsoft Windows 3.1, remember that? But how quickly viruses showed up on the scene. And, And suddenly you had this powerful software, but then the threat of a virus that could come take over your computer. And I think the, the first big worm or virus was the Trojan virus. And remember that? And that was the big threat that you would somehow get it onto your machine and it would, it would you know, turn into a big paperweight or take over and so forth. But it just struck me how, how quickly it went from having this, this clean, pristine tool that could do so much to then having a threat where something could come in, a virus could come in and could change it. And I think that's, that's similar to what we see with the gospel. The word gospel literally means good news. And it really is good news. It's great news. Because what, what the gospel is, is, is a transformation. It's a, it's a new covenant. It's a, it's a different covenant. And it's important to understand that it's not just the old covenant with a little Jesus attached to the side. It's a completely different way of operating. So under the old covenant, the Mosaic covenant, it was all about you and all about your performance and your effort and your struggle. And if you did everything right, then you would be blessed. Then you would be okay. But if you failed, then you would be cursed. And so it was all riding on your shoulders and your performance. But this was the good news. The good news was Jesus saying, it's not about you anymore. It's about me, Jesus said. And so the new covenant is all about what Christ has accomplished, what's already been done. It's based on his obedience and his work. And that's the good news that that the apostles got to herald, got to announce wherever they went, especially to those Jews that were in the synagogues who were struggling under the law. But also good news to the Gentiles because now they had a way to God that wasn't through Judaism, wasn't through the Mosaic law. And so it was good news for the whole world. But as soon as that good news was, was being announced, the virus comes in, where, where men would come in and they would distort the message. They would intentionally twist the message in order to, to ruin things and to change things. And, and as, I've, as I've taught this message of the new covenant and the freedom of what Christ has done in people, one of the things I hear over and over again is, how come we've not heard this before? Because the reality is it's, it's in the scriptures. And when you read the scriptures and you, you take them for what they honestly say, it, it's pretty clear. It is finished. You are forgiven. You are righteous. You are a new creation. It says it in plain text. And yet we've not always heard that over and over again. And, and so what's, people ask me, well, why have I not heard this before? And there are many answers to it. But I think the key answer is, is because we have an enemy. We have an enemy who's intentionally distorting this message, intentionally trying to hide it. Because if he can hide the truth by putting a little bit of a deception, a little bit of a lie in there, he puts us in bondage and we miss out on the freedom and the life that we have in Jesus. And so we see this. In fact, numerous times throughout scripture, we're warned against this. And one of the great pictures of that is in Acts chapter 20. It's it's before Paul is... is, um, it's his last chance to really speak to the church of Ephesus. He's, he's going to go back to Jerusalem where he's going to be arrested and then thrown in prison and eventually executed. And, and so he kind of knows, something inside of him knows, this is my last chance to speak to the, the church in Ephesus. So he called the elders to meet with him. And he says to them in Acts chapter 20, he says, listen, you overseers, I need you to pastor, I need to shepherd the flock because what's going to happen is ravenous, savage wolves are going to show up. And what do wolves do with sheep? They eat the sheep. And the warning was these savage wolves will show up. They'll come in after me. And some might even come up from within you. They'll rise up. And their purpose is to destroy the sheep. And they do that through twisting the message, through what they're going to teach. They're going to try to add things to the gospel and make the good news not so good because they're going to put that emphasis and weight back on you. And so he was warning of that was going to happen. And that's really what we're going to see in this passage here really what the issue has been going on with the church in Corinth that sparked this letter. 
And, and Paul's been kind of working up to it. And now he's, we're kind of in that section where he's addressing it head on, where there's these false apostles. And that's the first time he uses this phrase, these false apostles that are causing trouble with the church of Corinth. And so as we're going to kind of this morning see exactly why that's so critical and what, how do we identify those false apostles and how do we guard ourselves against those? All right, so let's pray. Heavenly Father, I'm so grateful this morning that we have you. We have the mind of Christ, which means that it's not about what I have to offer anyone. It's about what you want to speak through me. And I pray that your words be words of life, words of hope, words of freedom, words that would encourage us and that we would would be struck anew again how good the good news really is, how wonderful the good news of the gospel, the new covenant is, so that we would trust that so we'd experience life in you each and every day, and that would have influences in our family, in our friends, in our workplace, in our neighborhoods, and that you would be glorified in it all. In your name we pray, amen. So let's, let's read. We're going to begin in 2 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 5. We're going to read the verse 15 uh, this morning, but we're, not going to, we're going to kind of just go in the chunks as we go. But verses 5 and 6, Paul writes, For I consider myself not in the least inferior to the most eminent apostles. But even if I'm unskilled in speech, yet I am not so in knowledge. In fact, in every way we've made this evident to you in all things. He he, he calls them the most eminent apostles. That's how it's translated. And and on a service reading, you might think that he's actually talking about the other 12 apostles, Peter and John and and Matthew and and so forth. And he's saying, I'm not not inferior to those apostles, the, the people who walked with Jesus. But that's not who he's referring to. He's referring to the, the critics that Paul's facing here. And, and the word there that's translated eminent is, is really, you know, literally translated as super shiny or super sparkly. And, and so I love that phrase, that imagery, because he's, he's kind of throwing some shade on these people. He's calling them these super shiny apostles. And the idea is that they're very proud. They're very much about how they look and very much about their performance and what they look like. And they want to be seen. They want to be known. They want to be big and famous. And that's who he's, he's addressing here. And, and, and what's significant is you think about the city they're in. They're in the city of Corinth. And Corinth was a very wealthy city because a lot of trade would have to go through Corinth to go to the east, the eastern part of the Roman Empire. And so it was a very affluent city. It was a big city, lots of money. And you think about big cities like Los Angeles or California or New York or Toronto or London, everyone wants to be the big famous people there. They want to be the big fish in the big pond. And that's what they're attracted to. And so that's what these, these super shiny apostles were. They wanted to be seen. They wanted to be big and famous. And so they were all about having a lot of sparkle to their lives. And Paul calls him out on that and says, I am in no way inferior to these people, these super shiny apostles. Even if I'm unskilled in my speech, he says. Well, the Greek word for unskilled is idiotes. I kid you not. Did you see the root word where, where we get our English word from? Idiot, right? And I looked up the translation. It even included ignoramus. I thought that was great. And, he, and, and, and the idea is they would use that term, idiotes, on the common laborer. And so you think about, you know, the people, these super shiny apostles, they made their living off of their speaking ability and their performance. And, and they, they saw themselves as elite at the top upper echelon of society. But the people who are, you know, the common laborer, the guys making bricks, the the people who are sweeping the floor, the maids, they they were below them. They were in a different class in society. They were the idiotes, unskilled labor. They don't really have anything to offer. Anyone could do their job, really. So there's nothing special about them. And so he says, even if I am that idiotes, even if I am that, that idiot when it comes to speaking, that's not the point. And what he's doing, he's contrasting what, what these super shiny apostles offer, and what he's offering. Now, he's not saying that he's, he's a completely idiot when it comes to speaking, but I would concede that we see it in multiple parts of Paul's letter that he wasn't this great orator. 
He wasn't wonderful when he got up there and, and flashy in his, in his delivery. That wasn't his strength. But he offered something else, something more powerful. He offered them the knowledge, it says. And, and in context, I think we can safely say it was the knowledge of God he's offering them. Now, to understand really the significance here is there's two Greek words that are translated knowledge. One is ido, and it's to know about. And so it's about information. It's about statistics and so forth, right? So, for example, things that would qualify under that is Wayne Gretzky, his, you know, his uh, record for the, the most points in a season, I think it's 212. And that's a statistic, right? The, he's got, I think, the top three, and the, the fourth person is Mary Lemieux at 199 in a season, right? That's just information. That's Ido. But there's another Greek word, it's gnosis. And it's, a, it's translated knowledge, but it's to know intimately. And so I, I know some things about Wayne Gretzky. I know some statistics and some things about Wayne Gretzky, but I don't know Wayne Gretzky. But I know joy. I can know so joy. I know her intimately. I know what she's thinking and what she's feeling just by looking at her. I know when I'm in trouble. <laughs> I've, I've learned that, right? I know if she's having a good day or a bad day just by looking in her eyes. And I've, I've discovered that through time. I've discovered that through conversations and, and, and talking with her and spending time with her. And over our marriage, I've gotten to gnosis joy. I know her now. And so what Paul's offering is not this information about God. He's not saying what I'm offering you is I do, because I'm offering you gnosis, intimate knowledge of God walking with God. In essence, what he's saying is they offer you sl splashy performance, super sparkle. That's what they give you. But I give you life. I give you substance. It's, it's the equivalent of saying these guys, they offer you beautiful wax fruit, plastic fruit. It looks so good and delicious, but if you're ever to bite down on it, it wouldn't help you one bit. But I offer you a real apple. And you know what? That real apple may not be as shiny as you want it to be. It may not have the right coloring you want it to be, but you bite into that and it will be sweet. It will be good. That's what he's offering. He says, I'm offering you life. I'm offering you something way better than what the super splashy, super sparkly apostles could ever offer you. And, and I think of today, you know, uh, we live in a very social media, very, very image-based society that isn't really that different from what the city of Corinth would be. And so today, you know, these, these super sparkly apostles, they would probably fit in well today. They would have numerous followers and, and they would get up and they would have a clever turn of phrase and they would be, you know, people would laugh at their jokes and they, everything would go really smooth, but, but their message would be hollow. And, and when I listen to so many speakers out there, there's no life in what they're offering. There's just more effort, more work, more to do. But there's life that Jesus is offering us. And so that's what we're looking for. That's what we're after, is that life. So let's keep reading. <clears throat> verse, verse 7, Paul goes on. He says, or did I commit a sin in humbling myself so that you might be exalted? Because I preached the gospel of God to you without charge. I robbed other churches by taking wages from them to serve you. And when I was present with you and was in need, I was not a burden to anyone. For when the brethren came from Macedonia, they fully supplied my need. And in everything, I kept myself from being a burden to you and will continue to do so. So he starts by asking a rhetorical question. Did I, did I make a mistake? Did I sin by, by not, not taking financial aid from you? Was that the mistake? And, and the contrast here is that he lowered himself in order to exalt them, the, the church in Corinth. And again, it's so different. The, these super shiny, super sparkly apostles, they need to be exalted. And they're going to step on the backs of the church of Corinth so it can be about them. They want the biggest stage. They want the most followers. They want the, the, the largest crowds because it feeds their own proud ego. But Paul was saying, no, 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 it's the other way around. I'm going to humble myself in order to support you, in order to serve you, in order that you would be better off. And so he took this, this job, this seemingly um, that idiotes, that unskilled job where he was a tent maker. And again, these, these super shiny apostles, they saw that as a negative. 
I mean, if he was any apostle, if he was any really good of a, of a teacher, of a leader, he wouldn't need to do that kind of a job. He would be able to just make a living off of what he says. And so the fact that he needs to get paid somewhere else means he's really an amateur apostle. He's not quite as good as us. But Paul was saying that wasn't the point. I didn't want to be a burden on you because I wanted to show to you I didn't need your money. I didn't want your money. Not for me. I wanted you to give. And he, he explained that you know, earlier on in this book in, verses, in chapters 8 and 9. I want you to give to support others because that's the right thing to do. But I didn't want your money as a way to show to them, I wanted your heart. That's what I was after. It's after you. And, and it's important to see that because I think in, in the church in Corinth, they were so wrapped up in money. And Paul wanted to prove to them, I want you. And so he had the Macedonian church, like the Philippians, which would be the, the northern part of the Aegean Sea. Aegean sea. And, and, and so they were probably in a poor neighborhood or a part of the, of the world. And yet they were financing Paul's ministry in Corinth. And he says, and I'll continue to do so because I don't want your money. I want your heart. Again, he's contrasting himself with these super shiny apostles that really want them and their money. Go on to verse 10. As the truth of Christ is in me, this boasting of mine will not be stopped in the regions of Achaia. So Achaia is the province they're in, right? So Corinth is in this province of Achaia on the, the western part of the Aegean Sea. Why? Because I do not love you? God knows I do. But what I am doing, I will continue to do so that I might cut off opportunity from those who desire an opportunity to be regarded just as we are in the matter about which they are boasting. What he's saying here is this. I'm never going to stop what I'm doing. I'm never going to stop preaching the good news. I'm never going to, I'm going to continue to love you. I'm going to continue to hold fast to this message because this message is life and freedom. Anything else will put you in bondage and experience death. In fact, he goes on to say, I'm, I'm actually encouraged by what they're doing. I'm emboldened by what they're doing. That the fact that these men are trying to distort the good news emboldens me even more to come after you. And, and his, his reasoning here is really important to understand. It's not a, just about this competition. It's not just about personality. He's not like, I just don't like these people. They rub me the wrong way. And so I'm, I'm going to stand up against them. He sees something bigger at play. He knows, he knows there's so much more at happen here because there's a spiritual battle. It's a battle for the gospel. And the gospel matters. Because when, when you believe the truth, Jesus said, the truth will set you free. But the corollary of that is when you believe a lie, when you believe the deception or the distortion, you will be under bondage. You're going to struggle now. And that's what the flesh wants to do. It wants to put you back under that deception, those lies. And so he says, I see what they're doing and it emboldens me to fight, to fight for you. Even if that means at times getting in, in your face, even if that means stepping into conflict because I love you enough to do so. So he's embracing that role and he's, 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 he's coming after these people and in verse 13, and he goes on and he says, for such men are false apostles. It's the first time he, he calls them this, the false apostles. They're not real apostles. He wasn't, up to this point, you might say, well, he was just trying to knock them down a little bit because they had placed themselves over uh, him. And, and here he comes out in the most strictest, boldest language. He says, they're not real apostles. They're fake and he goes on and says, deceitful workers, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. No wonder, for even Satan disguised himself as an angel of light. Therefore, it is not surprising if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, whose end will be according to their deeds. So not only are they false apostles, but he's, he's compared them or associated them with who? With Satan himself. And so we see now that this, this virus is intentional. That the, 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 the twisting and the deception of the gospel is not just, oh, it was a simple mistake. It was intentional in trying to put people into bondage. It was these savage wolves that Paul warned about in Ephesus. And, and really, we see multiple places in scripture where it's warned about these false apostles or false teachers or false prophets. 
Uh, John warns about this. In 1 John chapter 4, beginning in verse 1, turn your Bibles there. It's worth reading. So not the gospel of John, but the, the first epistle of John. So towards the back. If you hit Revelation, you've gone too far. If you've gone back to Genesis, you've gone too far. Somewhere in between. <clears throat> not an idiote speaker right here, let me just say. <laughs> all right? 1 John chapter 4, verse 1. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits. Right? Don't believe everything that's being said, whether, whether that's online, whether that's on the radio, whether it's coming from the stage. Don't just believe just because someone said it. And I, I've seen it too many times where, where someone says, well, this, this famous speaker said it. Yep. Yep. Or well, I read it in this commentary. Yep. That's true. You read it. You heard it. But keep in mind, every commentator is a common tater. You catch that? Not my joke, friend of mine's joke, but it's the, the point is they're just like you and me. They're fallible, they can make mistakes. And, and so sometimes they're right, sometimes they're not. The only people that we know are absolute are the original apostles that wrote this book. That's what we come back to. But everyone else, every speaker, every teacher, every author is a commentator. And so test everything that's being said to see whether they are from God, because many false prophets, now he's using false prophets here, others, again, false apostles, false teachers, they're all kind of lumped in together, have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess that Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, of which you have heard that is, is coming and now already is in the world. You are from God, little children, and have overcome them because greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. They are from the world. They speak as from the world. Their message is going to be worldly, and the world listens to them. We are from God, and he knows God listens to us. He who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of the truth and the spirit of the error. Or here's another one. Let's go to 2 Peter. Go to the left a couple books. 2 Peter chapter 2. <clears throat> Verses 1 to 3. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be also false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies. Did you catch that? It's not just benign. What they're teaching is destructive even denying the master who bought them, bringing swift destruction upon themselves. Many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their judgment from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. Last one, let's read the words of Jesus. Go to Matthew. Matthew chapter 7. Verse 15. And a new Bible that's just fighting me here. Just talk amongst yourselves for a moment. It is. It is. <laughs> there we go. And seven's after six. <clears throat> All right. Verse 15. Beware of the false prophets. Again, Jesus offers who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. Exempt the same warning that Paul offered to the church in Ephesus. You will know them by their fruits. Grapes are not gathered from thorn bushes, nor figs from thistles, are they? So every good tree bears good fruit, but the bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot produce bad fruit, nor can a bad tree produce good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So then you will know them by their fruits. And there's more passages. And so this, this repetition is important to us. And that's why I wanted to read it to us, is that we always need to be on guard, on, uh, be aware of, of what's being offered to us. 
Now, please understand, not every teacher that offers something that doesn't line up with the new covenant is automatically a false teacher. I want to make that point because there's no teacher today that has perfect knowledge and understanding of the new covenant. We're all growing. We're all learning, right? We're, we're, all, we're all learning to, 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 um, to, to, to discover what the purity of the new covenant really is. So just because you hear a teacher and you're like, I don't know if that quite lines up, that doesn't automatically leave them as a false teacher. Their teaching might be false, but they still have a new heart. They still belong to Jesus. Whereas these false teachers, false prophets, false apostles, what Jesus is saying and what John is saying, what Peter is saying is they're not actually one of us. They're from the world and they're offering worldly wisdom. And Jesus says, you will know them by their fruits. You'll know them by how they live. And so you can take a look. Really, there's two ways to identify. One is their character and the other is their message. And so their character will be one of pride kind of like these super sparkly, super shiny apostles. It was their pride. It was about them. And so what's their message? What are they, what are they pushing? And we see this. The, the, some are more easy to, to spot, like the TV evangelists out there, where it's, you know, it's all about giving to them so that they could have a bigger platform. They could have a nice you know, new jet because the old private jet's too small. You want them to have a really big, fancy new private jet. And, and it's about their comfort. It's about their experiences. It's about them. When really, when we teach, who's it ought to be about? It's about Jesus. And so it doesn't matter how big the platform is. It doesn't matter how big the stage is. It doesn't matter how many people hear the message. As long as God was glorified, that's all that counts. But these false teachers, these false apostles, false prophets, it's going to be about their pride. It's going to be about them. They're going to be lovers of money. That's why Paul says in 2 Timothy 3, when he's talking about the qualifications of elders, he says, make sure that they're not lovers of money because it's so easy to get, to get uh, trapped by that. A friend of mine, when I told him that I was going into pastoral ministry, he said, there are three things you got to watch out for. It's the glory, it's the, the gold, and the girls. So those three things have taken down pastors more than anything else. That fame, that pride, because you get people coming up to you and say, oh, well done. Oh, that message changed my life. It could really feed your ego. The girls, because of the temptation, but this, this gold, that there are some who just get, they see it as a way to get rich. They see it as a way to profit off of other people. And so they need your money and they're always looking for your money. And so they're lovers of money. They see it as a way to be rich. And we see that throughout the New Testament. Or we see it as a life of immorality. Similar to that idea of, about girls, where, where it's not that they struggle with sin. The problem is that they don't struggle with sin. That they've adopted a lifestyle of sin and they justify it. They make excuses for it. And, and so again, we, we see this easily in certain cults where they use the scripture, they use the Bible as evidence as to why you should follow this leader, but then they've got multiple wives or they're, they're abusing little children, or, or they, they have an anger issue, and they, don't, they, they feel justified and emboldened by it. They're not struggling with their sin. And so that's how we can begin to identify that there's something, their heart isn't right, because their heart isn't right. It's a facade. They, they act godly, but they don't have the life of Jesus inside them. And so it starts to come out. And, and when you can see it when you challenge them a little bit, when, when they start to get upset. Here's an example. Have you seen the Lord of the Rings movies? If you haven't, I would question your salvation. <coughs> just, just me, though. Um, but, but if you've seen, there's, there's a movie, there's a scene in there where, where they show up in Rivendale and um, uh, Frodo has the ring and he shows it to Bilbo. And, and Bilbo goes for the ring and there's the, the, it becomes a bit of a jump scare where all of a sudden you see the anger in Bilbo's face as he's like, he sees the ring and he wants it. And that's what will happen when you challenge these false apostles, these false teachers, these false prophets, you'll see a rage spark up inside them. And in that moment, you see their true heart because they're being challenged and they have to power up to control things. And you'll, you'll see it over and over again. And then the last part there, I think you'll see in their character is that need for control. They got to control you. They have everything control because everything is about them. They need the performance to look good 
because then they look good. They're afraid to be associated with anything that is not perfect because that's a, a poor reflection of them. And so they would only want to hang out with the people who are successful. But you think about Jesus, who did he hang out with? The fishermen, the tax collectors, the prostitutes, the drunkards, the idiotes, did he not? The unskilled people, he was not ashamed to be hanging out with them. In the same way, he's not ashamed to be hanging out with you and I. And he didn't need you and I to act perfectly all the time. And so the reality is that, that these false apostles, they, they will shun anyone that is a negative impact on them. They need everything to be perfect. They need everything to look good and look right. But the reality is that Jesus set us free so we'd be free. That's what he's after. It's for freedom that he set you free. Where the, where the spirit of the Lord is, we saw this earlier in 2 Corinthians 3, where the spirit of the Lord, there is freedom, not control. And so when you see, when you hear teachers that are trying to control you and use you, manipulate you, that's not right. They should be empowering you and emboldening you and, and letting you live in the freedom you have. But it's scary because now I have to trust the Holy Spirit in you to lead you rather than me to lead you. So there's a, that's the character part. But there's also a message part that we can use to identify these false teachers. And, and the first one we saw earlier was this, we saw in 1 John 4 is, do they deny Jesus is God? And, and we see that in a lot of religions, whether it be in Islam, where they recognize Jesus is a prophet, but just a prophet. He's not actually God. Or in Buddhism or Hinduism or even Judaism, they would recognize he was a good teacher, Jesus. He was a good rabbi, but that's it. He's a bit off his rocker. Well, you can't have it both ways, right? The, the C.S. Lewis principle where either he's a liar, he's a lunatic, or he is Lord because he declared himself as God. It's what got him killed ultimately, right? Before Abraham, Jehovah, I am. He, he declared himself God, which is why they pick up their stones and wanted to kill him in that moment. And they set out to destroy him and kill him because of that. And the charge against him was blasphemy because he said he was God. So either he was lying about it, he's a crazy man, or he's in fact Lord. And, and you look at all these other religions, again, Islam, Judaism, even Jehovah Witnesses or the Mormons, they would only recognize Jesus as either a man or a God, but not part of the triune God. And so anyone that denies that, you know, is a false teacher. And so that's how we know Mormonism and Jehovah Witnesses and so forth. That's not the true gospel. Or they deny Jesus is the only way. I've seen, I've seen teachers get up there. And I'm, I, I've debated whether I actually name him. I'm going to name him. His name is John Hagee. And I think it's important to name it because, because as Paul called out these super shiny apostles, I think it's important for us to call out sometimes when we see, see that, that wrong teaching. And I remember seeing John Hagee. He had a big TV ministry and, and him getting up there. And he, he was very chummy with, the, with Jews. He was all for Israel and he had a ministry for Israel. But he he compromised the gospel because he says, as Christians, we need Jesus, but the Jews, they can get to heaven if they follow the law. He didn't want to offend the Jews, but he watered down the gospel. He twists it and he made the gospel about good works. But if that were the case, Paul writes in Galatians 2.21, that if righteousness could come through the law, if righteousness could come through your performance, then Jesus died for nothing. There's no point. He would simply say, Craig, just try harder. Just do better. But Craig could never do better. He could never do it enough. And Susan says amen to that. <laughs> and that's why Craig needed Jesus. And that's why we all need Jesus. And so you'll see that they'll, they'll deny that Jesus is the only way, that there's, there's, there's many ways. And we even see this today where there's, there's like the, the elephant illustration, right? Where Christians are holding the trunk and, and others, you know, the Jews are holding the, the, the back leg and others are holding the tail and, and it's all part of the same uh, elephant and all religions ultimately lead to God. Not true. Remember what Jesus says? I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, no one could come to the Father except through Jesus. Again, if we, if we think that, that everything leads to Jesus, then we're saying that Jesus was wrong. We know better than Jesus. We know better than God himself. 
And then finally, they deny the apostles' teaching. As we again saw in 1 John 4, verse 6, that, that we know that they're from God because they agree with us, John says. Those are the apostles, the men that walked with God for three and a half years when he walked this earth as Jesus. And, and again, we see this so many times nowadays where <clears throat> there's, a, there's a growing movement within the church where we're trying to distance ourselves from the, the Bible, from the scriptures, from the apostles' teaching. That's what's so beautiful. And again, sometimes we have to understand that's what this is in the New Testament. And the New Testament, the new covenant begins at the cross. It didn't begin in Matthew. It begins at the cross. And so all those letters from uh, the, the book of Acts and, and Romans and all the epistles, that's the apostles' teaching. What the apostles, the men who walked with God, they were teaching us the new covenant. And John says, when, you, when they agree with us, with the apostles' teaching, you know they're from us. But when they reject this, when they, when they pretend to know better, you know that they're from the world. And that's what we see. We, we see a, a movement to say that this book here was 2,000 years old. Times have changed, right? This was pre-internet. It, it was, it was pre-indoor uh, plumbing. It, it doesn't, doesn't speak to us today. And so now, now we know better. Now we've learned better. Now we know more. And so we can now, you know, reject this idea that, that there's only two genders. Even though that's what Jesus said. There's multiple genders. Or we can reject that there's, there's roles for male and female and that they're equal, but they are different. And God designed them differently to, to express themselves in different roles. And that's good and that's healthy. But we can reject that because we know better. Or when it comes to issues like submission and authority, we can reject that because we know better. And what we're doing essentially is we're saying, we know more than these men who walked with Jesus. And we therefore place ourselves as God. Because remember, it wasn't just what these apostles came up with. As it says in, in Peter, that these apostles, they wrote as they were being carried along by the Holy Spirit. That ultimately, this is the Holy Spirit's words through those apostles. And that's what we're following. But anyone that says, oh, we know better, we can dismiss the scriptures. They're false teachers. They're false apostles. And so we're to test the spirits. We're to test the message. We're to make sure that we, we can recognize and understand that what they're saying lines up and matches with what the scriptures say. And that's what these Berean Christians would do. And I would encourage you again, be a Berean. Anything you hear from the stage, uh, online, in a book, test it with the scriptures. Does it line up with the new covenant? So how do we guard ourselves then? How do we make sure that we're okay? I think that's the, the, the application for us. And again, I want to stress, just because someone says something that's in error doesn't make them a false teacher. Every teacher who's going to get up here and, and say anything about God at some point will say something wrong. I guarantee it, right? There's no one who has the, the market cornered on truth, especially myself. Is that clear? And so you, you hear what is being said, compare it to scripture, does it make sense? Because every one of us, we're a bag of dust. We're human beings. And, and we're, we don't have perfect discernment. The only person who ever has had perfect discernment to walk this earth was Jesus Christ. Now we can trust the scriptures because we trust the Holy Spirit worked in that. But beyond what's in this book, every commentator is a commentator. But again, there are people out there that aren't just made a mistake or that they were, they're just repeating a mistake that there was taught to them. There are people out there, these savage wolves, these ravenous wolves that are intentional in their deceptions. They're intentional in what they're trying to do, which is so division to, to rob us of the glory of God, to, to put us back into bondage. And, and again, these are the people who are looking for their pride, looking to profit off the gospel. They're looking to justify their own immorality. These are the false prophets. And, and I think what we can do is, in part, it's on us as elders to make sure what we're, what's being taught is, in fact, the truth. And as elders, we take that seriously. I, I, that's probably the biggest thing. You can, you can verify that with the other elders, but I think the biggest thing we do is we make sure that what is being taught, not just from this stage, but especially to those little ones downstairs, as what's being taught is the new covenant. 
because we know the power of what's being taught and how that changes lives. So that matters the most. And so we, we take that responsibility seriously. However, we could only go so far because again, you'll hear something online, you'll read a book, you'll listen to the radio, and you're going to be out there and be exposed to all kinds of other teaching. And not just in Christian circles, but even in the world. Because the world is trying to teach you. The world is trying to, to profit or trying to evangelize you to their gospel. And so you're going to be exposed to all kinds of other teaching. And so there's a responsibility that you bear to be on guard yourselves. And I think the best way to guard yourself is to be able to recognize what is a counterfeit. And you've probably heard this illustration before. Many have used it in this idea here about counterfeit bills. That when they're, they're training uh, bank tellers or when they're training people who work for uh, the financial institutions of how to spot a counterfeit, what do they give them? They give them the real thing. So here's an actual $20 bill. Here's a real $100 bill. Here's a real toonie. Study it. Feel it. Get to know its weight. Look for all the different security features in here. And, and if you look in close, you see how this has this date and have the, the writing here. And look at the portrait, the, the queen or now the king coming and, and all these little details. And they study it and they study it and they study it and they study it to the point where someone now hands them a counterfeit and just by the touch of it, they go, something's not right. And then they begin to investigate and they explore and go, oh, there it is. They didn't use the right watermark or they didn't have the right uh, hologram in here. There's something off there because the counterfeit is not perfect. And so what do we do? We, we study Jesus. And I love this. It goes back to what Paul offers. Remember what Paul offered? Not, not Ido, not just information about, he offered gnosis, knowledge of intimate knowledge. He knew Jesus. And so what do we do? We get to know Jesus. Get to know his heart, his love for you, his sacrifice for you, what he craves and desires in your freedom, in, your, in, in empowering you, that relationship with Jesus, who's a, a loving God, a loving father who cares for you, who, who went to hell and back so that he could present you to his father as pure and perfect. Get to know that Jesus. We walk with Jesus. So that when we hear something, he says, that doesn't line up with who Jesus is. That doesn't match the character of Jesus. That doesn't match this, this new covenant message. Because you see, it's easy to spot the lies where, where it denies that Jesus is God in the, in the Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses and so forth, or even Islam. It's easy to spot those false teachers. But you know the ones that, are, that we're most susceptible to following are the ones that say, yes, he is God. And yes, he went to the cross. And yes, you are forgiven, but now you need to do more. Now you need the law. Now you need to perform. Because how do you know you're really okay? How do you know you're really accepted? How do you know you're really righteous? Those are the teachers that we have to watch out for the most because they prey on that doubt. They prey on that voice of shame. See, shame says, you know, I, I blew it the other day. Am I really that loved? Am I really forgiven? Am I really accept? I don't know. I got things in my life I just can't seem to, to get over. I, I seem to struggle a lot. I seem to make a lot of mistakes. I seem to hurt people around me that I love. Maybe, maybe if, I, if I follow that teaching, I just, I just put in some, some rules. That will keep everyone safe. I just, I just need a good process, a, a good formula to make sure that I'll be all right. Just got to make sure I read my Bible and I pray and I give and I serve and I do all these things and then I'll be protected. And suddenly my eyes are off of Jesus and onto who? Me. And that's the most subtle false teaching out there. It's about self. It's about you. And it's not about Jesus anymore. It's not about his glory and what he's done and what he's doing right now. And so we study that. We focus on that. We get to know Jesus and when anyone, someone comes along and tries to pull your eyes off of Jesus onto something else, it's counterfeit. Even when that something else is loved by the world's definition, you'll recognize and say that it's not actually love. It's not actually good and healthy. And what you're calling good is actually evil. 
And, and what, what is evil, you're calling good. And I know it because I know the real thing, because I know Jesus. And so that's what we focus in on. And that's what we spend our time focusing or, or chasing, seeking him and that intimate knowledge with him. Let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for your grace. Thank you for your mercy and the freedom we have in you now. And we have, we have false prophets and teachers and, and people out there that are, are out to sabotage this freedom we have in you through the new covenant. Who are out to disparage your name. Who are out to disparage what you've done. Who are trying to get our mind off of you and onto ourselves and our own performance. And I pray, Lord, that, that as we get to know you and get to know what you've done, get to know your heart, get to know your voice, that it'll become apparent when that voice of shame, when the flesh tries to lead us astray, or when false teachers lead us astray, and we'll say, no, I reject that because I know what I have in Jesus, and we'll place our trust wholeheartedly in you. Thank you that we can do that. In your name we pray, amen. Hey, I hope you enjoyed that message and it blessed you as we discover more about this great life we have in Jesus. I wanna encourage you to, to like and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And also you can check out these videos here and watch more sermons and more messages. It really will encourage you in the, the joy and the power that we have in Jesus Christ.